This story began, as so many stories often do, with a tip to the newsroom. Blatant, uh, out in the open, smoking of marijuana at Attleboro High School. Drug dealers, students, selling marijuana and other drugs to other students at the school. That's what he claimed. Dealing with more than just marijuana? Operating at Attleboro High. Please walk in the class absolutely zoomed it out of their mind. So if you hear somebody saying, watch that, that would be my voice. This is an introduction to mobile video and state-of-the-art technology in 1979. To hear the music, used to go to a lot of, a lot of shows on so many great concerts back then. Was it right to go over and rock that band? Kids rock the car. Ah, they were just rocking it. Beating it up pretty good. Well, we had that thing rocking. But once we started shaking the band, tipping it up, it came more than what it is. You see what the drugs are doing to our kids? The reporter and photographer became part of the story through no design of their own. What about your designs? What about your dreams? Problem. The police department knows about the problem, the administration knows about the problem, and the students know about the problem. So it's just... Uh, How many dealers are there, would you say, mm, operating at Attleboro High? 200. 200, you know, around there. 200? More. Most of them students? No. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. Is that it? The only thing I can think of is that I walked around the van. Is that you? Oh, no, that's not me. I think it's really bad that they picked on Attleboro. It was a setup, and actually, it's illegal to do something like that. There are people who say, you know, that this incident at Attleboro High School propelled her into the big time. And it's sad to think that in order to get to the big time, you have to do unethical things to get there. Kids aren't as dumb as you think they are. They knew who you were, and they knew what you were doing, and they just led you on. And you bought it hook, line, and sinker. Well, let's put it this way. When she turns up on my television screen, I change the station. This is my 33rd year at WJAR Channel 10. I was hired here in 1978 as the assignment editor, basically in charge of the day-to-day -day news that you see on the 6 o'clock news every night. I started at Attleboro High School in September of 1964. I had been a teacher in Boston, and I was getting ready to get married. Attleboro was one of the places that I, that I applied to and ultimately was offered a, a position. Many people who uh, experimented with marijuana in high school 30 years ago are now prominent citizens, business executives, successful business people, successful career people, and others may be in jail. <laughs> What was that? Just say your name. Yeah. <laughs> I'm deaf too, bro. Sorry about that. Admiral right. High, class of 79. That's all I went. Ninth grade, one term. Then I got booted out of the house, so, you know, it was military or jail. I'm Randy Sabatini, class of 1980, Admiral High School. Mike McCray. I graduated in 79. My name is Joe Hudson, Jr. I live in Norton, Mass now. <laughs> To be honest, all my buddies went to jail, I went to the Army. A lot of years of rock and roll, the hair ain't that good, you know? What year was that? The spring of 79. Yeah, I was a senior. Regular day at Attleboro, everybody arrived in the, into the school. Everybody would just congregate around looking for when's the next party, and what are we doing for the weekend. 
regular mod and everyone would go in the pit, you know, bake up and either go into school or out. And they made the mistake of putting the park right next to the high school. Not a great idea. And it was great for us. So you start lighting up your cigarettes and next you know, somebody's passing around a joint. It was a common morning activity. You, you get started. I really didn't smoke pot until 1976. Freshman year in high school, standing out in the pit, and everybody was doing it. I got to school, smoked a joint, went to class stoned, and then smoked every day till I graduated. And what I wasn't doing, I just, one day I just happened to join in and... You get indoctrinated into the culture of smoking pot every single day. Oh, and the pills, there were huge amounts of pills. I see them in the pit, Ugh, you know what I mean? They're out of their mind in the pit. It was like, let's go to the pit. You're talking about, you know, in the morning. You know, you leave home, you go to the pit, and your brother's wiped out already, they're drinking, drink, you know. Oh yeah, smoking because they're doing all the pills. I don't really remember if I took the phone call or if somebody else did, but we were made aware that students at Attleboro High School were openly smoking marijuana during recess and other breaks right out uh, in the school. I guess it's a courtyard, I'm not sure what it's called. The pit. The pit. The pit. The pit. The pit. The pit. There was an area that dipped down. Like a sunken living room type almost, which had bench seats around it and stuff. And it was about a two foot drop. And the kids called that the pit. That's where the pit name came from. I can't tell you what year it was, but that, that got filled in. And you would never know that it existed. It just went from there to the outside part because you couldn't smoke on the inside. The buses would pull in. It had the library on top of here and stuff. And they never knew where, the, where it came from to begin with. I always have to chuckle. Something like that catches on and I'll meet you at the pit. You know. The coming of age was 18. So we were allowed at 18 to be able to drink. And quite a few of us at our junior year were 18 years old. Now that we're all in the pit smoking cigarettes, what better way to get high because it's being masked by the cigarette smoke. I mean, the, the pit was a fishbowl. People used to walk into class, I mean, just absolutely zooted out of their mind. You could see the smoke billowing out of the pit in the morning. You could actually watch it rolling up the library. It was a big social gathering before your classes started. If anybody picked on, like, kid was fat or had glasses, I wouldn't allow it. The geeks, the jocks, the potheads, let's all have a good time. And that's all I teach my kids, just because someone's different. Don't let somebody sit there and beat them up and, you know, I didn't, I didn't go for that. Let's enjoy every day as it was like our last. The school in 1979 was practically at its peak in terms of student population. Attleboro High School peaked at 2,520 students. That's a lot of teenagers in one place. We were forgotten and ignored. Our classes were oversized. This isn't my job description. I don't have to deal with this. I'm here to teach the kids. Who cares if he's stoned and messed up? Put him in the nurse's office. There's a bed, right? Okay, we got a bed. Put him in there. We haven't got time for him. They weren't oblivious. They knew what was going on. It was really tough because you would have to catch a kid actually doing something. They really couldn't do nothing back then, you know what I mean? They couldn't do nothing. You know, if they caught you, yeah, they'd send you to the principal and then you'd be in trouble. You know, they'd call the cops on you or whatever, but... There were teachers that used to sit out in the pit and watch us smoke pot every single day, day after day. The house masters used to drive around in their little yellow bus around Capron Park and everybody used to hide for a moment. We'd be sitting there and everyone, here they come, and it'd be like a stampede of buffalo. Two and all trying to get us, like... We hid on the bushes, he was standing right there looking for it. I could have bit him in the leg. Everybody running from here to the other side of the field and, you know, pretty comical stuff. I mean, I'd skip school, my math teacher would see me out there in the swing and I'm smoking a joint, swinging, and she'd look at the window, I'd wave to her and she'd be like, <laughs> you know, this kid's out of control. But she was cool. They just pretty much walked by. I mean, it was obvious. It was, everyone was baking up and all you could smell was weed everywhere. It was, you know. It's not like anyone was trying to hide anything. I remember we all <laughs> dropped acid one day and we're all like laying on the ground, ah, not even be able to move. And my science teacher goes by like on a class expedition walking by with all the people and they're like looking at us, uh, laying in the grass. And marijuana is a lot different, you know what I mean? If you do, if you do the acid, you're out of your mind, you, you know? You're lucky to come back down. We jump in the car, one guy would be on the other side grabbing the vehicles, swing around the pit, 
pick everybody up, and then we'd race to Riccati's sub shop. We used to have a spot down in Attleboro on Grant Street. It was like down an old cul-de-sac, and everybody used to just park down there and drink. Cops would come and just say, get out of here. We would go down to La Salette, party there for 15 minutes, get a fire going, the cruisers would come down. All right, we'll go to 1910. It was a riot, I mean. Little did we know, they, yeah, they're going to 1910. Jean jackets, concert t-shirts, moccasins. <laughs> The old moccasins we bought from Much's Leather up in the center of town. It was like, um, there was a lot of doom and gloom everywhere. Brock was evil. In fact, I think we were all evil. In the, in the eyes of, of, of a lot of people, we were all evil. So let's give him a good show. I think that's what we probably did. We gave him a good show. I had a great childhood. I mean, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Attleboro was a good place to grow up. And... Oh, so many great concerts back then, you know I mean? I've... I've been to like 60, 70 rock concerts. A lot of music myself, I played and I loved it. I mean, we used to play all the time. And Driving around, listening to music cranked. You know, rock and roll was in too. Seeing who could do the longest patch around the corner. I remember seeing the pit doors destroyed one day when I went to school and there was, and the, and the, and the car had gone through the pit and then, if I'm not mistaken, went down through the hall and out through the cafeteria area. I went over to the pit and kid made a little skid mark on the abs and then I actually drove right to the doors with my hand and flails. Throughout the pit, the donuts down the hallway, back out, to get home. I came out in the morning, what the hell? All the doors, all these burnouts in the pit. I was like, do do do. We all heard tales and stories about that, but I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of who did it, but I do remember the damage to the pit. Ladies like doubting us, but we were joking around about weed and stuff, and I forgot the teacher. She was pretty cool. Everybody whips out their bags out of their pocket under the de under the desks of the thing there, and she's like, "Oh my God, put that away." Uh, you have to remember the times. This was 1979. Now, <laughs> I was only about 11 years out of high school myself. Meredith was maybe seven years out of high school or eight years out of high school. And, you know, we were savvy enough to know that high school students, maybe in large numbers at that time, were experimenting with marijuana and other drugs. However, what, what surprised us, what baffled us, was that it was being done right out in the open. But that's, that was our adventures back then. Wow, you guys really carry all that on you all the time, you know? You let us get away with it. <laughs> Until Meredith came along. <laughs> she put, put things in perspective for out of Ohio. Woke everybody up. Maybe some telephone calls have been made to the media about the, the drug problem in Attleboro, and particularly in Cape and Park. I remembered of the guy who was angry because he'd been caught speeding, and he said to the judge, I wasn't the only one. Everybody was going that rate of speed. And the guy said, did you ever go fishing? He said, yes. He said, did you ever catch every fish? And he said, no. He said, well, we don't catch every speeder, but we caught you. Meredith, who was a very enterprising reporter even back then, found someone who claimed to be one of a hundred or more drug dealers selling marijuana and other drugs to other students at the school. That's what he claimed. Part of that uh, interview was aired on our 6 o'clock news over one or two nights, and as you can imagine, created quite a controversy. How long have you been dealing uh, at the high school? Uh, about two years. How many dealers are there, would you say, mm, operating at Attleboro High? 200. 200, you know, around there. 200? More. Most of them students? Yeah. See, even here, she was careful to hide his identity. Most of them dealing with more than just marijuana? Yeah. Mescaline, speed, yeah. downers? Yeah. Everyone has known about this problem. Now, was, was that, uh, you know, student embellishment? Like a lot of kids, they like to exaggerate for two reasons. Number one, I'm such a big guy, so they tend to exaggerate for that and how much I deal. And number two, oh, if everybody's in it, so obviously it can't be me that's doing something bad because everybody's doing it. I hate the everybody's doing it. Were there, were there drug pushers in Capron Park waiting for kids? I think there were. 200 drug dealers? Maybe uh, your now adult former high school students could, could tell you if that was an exaggeration or if that was really the case. 
Yeah. That seems like an exaggeration, but I mean, on any given day, that I mean, guys just standing out there. I mean, with a you know the glad baggy, you know, pl you know, regular freaking just full of joints, just standing there. La da da da. Two hundred dealers in the school? I don't think so. There wasn't two hundred dealers. Some dealers in the school? Yeah, probably. I, I, sure. I would go to school, I'd hitchhike, Randy would you know, pick us up every morning because he knew we were good for a bone every morning on the way in. So we'd smoke one with him on the way in. As soon as we'd hit the front of the school, we'd smoke another one. Walking through the halls, that was our thing. We'd go through the halls. But, um, yeah, I had my little bag of joints, usually like, I don't know, when I have like 40 or 50, and I would just hang them right in front so that people could see them. Because that's how they knew we were selling joints. They would come over and just go, well, what do you got? And they'd look in your bag, see who's got good joints, and then they'd buy one for a buck a piece. It was a buck a joint. Come on, you see lines all the way down where the bus would come in. I'm talking all the way at the end, and I'm standing, well, oh, thank you, thank you, you know what I mean? It was uh, quite the business. Did we ever apprehend anybody? Yes, we did. And we turned it over to the police. And she was asking leading questions. He gave her a story. You might have had... 200 students getting high, which I'll share with you if you share with me. Actually, probably about maybe 10 of us at the most, you know what I mean? And it was a competition where we had the biggest, so that's why we rolled the biggest ones and, and we let them have a choice. I have it, you don't? All right, yeah. You want one? You want a joint? Here you go. Give me 50 cents. Give me a dollar. It was cheap back then, you know, 35, 40 bucks, you get an ounce of a killer right up to the lid. You know, we weren't big drug dealers. We were just kids that bought a bag of weed. And now I realize I pay $20 for a bag of weed, but if I can roll up 40 joints, I can get my $20 back and have $20 to go out this weekend with my girl. This is what we lived through. We were, we were subjected every single day. It was the lifestyle. It was normal to do. And you know, hey, your little brother's out there selling weed, you know, and what do you think you're doing? Like, that guy, guy, what am I doing? I'll make over 20, 50 bucks. Oh, all right, bro, yeah. You know, give him one, there you go. <laughs> Once I got out of school, I had Adam Rose, Seacon, and Behold, but they were all my schools. I had them all. All I did was deliver them. On my bike, you know what I mean? Give it to them. I'll see you at the end of the week, okay? I'm like, I'm like, okay, I look for you. That was back then, and that's, that was a good business for us. One of the members, you know, until the band situation, I stopped. To check it out, we decided to send Meredith uh, and the photographer in an unmarked van to park near the high school and to shoot through the window of the van whatever activity was happening there. It didn't take them too long to see a bunch of students smoking marijuana right out in that courtyard area. Me and Mike, we, we were kind of like standing there. I'm like, check out that white van over there. We looked over and noticed the van. And it was diagonally parked across and it had the smoked out window. Nobody ever parked there. It was obviously there was something going on. I go, I bet you there's a freaking camera behind there trying to record everybody. But one kid had walked by and looked inside. We walked around the back side of the van, couldn't see anything in, couldn't see anything in. When we got around the front side of the van, you see the guy in there in the camera looking at him. He didn't even know we were there. And then came over to everybody and goes, hey, I think there's cameras in that van. We're going, what? Yeah, Newswatch 10. Hey, everybody, look at this. Check this out. Hey, the news that they're recording. The cameras, what the f The psychologists call it emotional contagion. I remember looking in the window, you know, and we're shaking it, and they were in there recording. It was the news. It gets stirred up, and suddenly it draws people into it. It looked like hundreds of people running out of the pit at the, at the van. Let's just rock their world right now and do it hard and fast. They just charge the thing and just have a storm. Everybody comes running over. Grabbed the thing and started rocking it. And Caught me in the middle of the, you know, the, the camera going, yeah, into the van and stuff. That was a good moment for my parents, by the way. It made them real proud. When you see a scene like that, those are things that people get involved in that they would never do by themselves. It started to get up on two wheels, and that's when I started to get a little bit worried. I think the wheels actually came off the ground at one point. I mean, I don't know. I don't think we're actually trying to tip it over. We're just trying to leave the guy inside a ride. At one point, I'm not sure if it can be heard on the, uh, on the videotape, but uh, 
I know Meredith was saying, hey, there's people in here. She's like, stop, stop, you'll kill them, you'll kill them, stop, stop, that, the camera will fall on them, blah, blah, blah. We're all ready to push it over. I'm going, guys, where's this going to take us if this van goes over? They might have wanted to tip the van over. I, I wasn't that violent. They were beating it up pretty good. I'm sure the people inside were probably rushed out getting, getting tossed back and forth, you know what I mean? And I go, all right, all right, it's all, it's all calm down now. Let's take a break and back off. We almost tipped that thing over. If we did, we would have been in real trouble. But we destroyed everything in that van, I guarantee that. Screw these people, they're not worth the effort. And then that's when we all started to kind of walk away from it. But if they wanted to have turned that van over in the numbers that were there, they could have done it. I think administrators or teachers at the school noticed there was some kind of disturbance going on and it came to an end. Then the fun was over, I think, at that point, you know. Just leave it be. I think they were upset that clandestinely they were being videotaped without their knowledge. You didn't think about what your parents were saying or what your parents would think about this. You're just thinking, F you guys, you're invading my privacy here. And there might have been a few people in the party that did want to tip the van over, so it might have been borderline. Like, she might have actually stopped the tipping of the van over by yelling out, stop, you'll kill him, you'll kill him. The camera will fall on him, you'll kill him. Nobody was injured, but uh, it, I'm sure, provided some scary moments for the crew inside the van. They showed uh, footage from it, the camera rocking, and this is what happened when they discovered we were here. This is one of those instances where the reporter and photographer became part of the story uh, through no design of their own. And they showed it on TV that night, too, when we got home. Thank God I wasn't on it. You can see Mike McCray's face and, and Joey Hudson right on the windshield, you know? <laughs> My dad said, was you on the news last night? No, it wasn't me, Dad. It wasn't me. It must have been some other black kid. It wasn't me. Thought it was pretty funny, actually, you know? Thought it was cool that I was on TV, you know. Right away, my my dad knew McCray and Joe Hudson, you know. So it's like, the f is this? It's like, ah, you know. Yeah. Parents weren't happy about it. Grandparents were especially not happy about it. But you know, 16 years old, you know, what are you gonna do? Being the only black kid in the school didn't help, but it wasn't me. Where are you in all this? And I told them I wasn't there. I wasn't actually behind the scenes, Dad. You know what I mean? Any repercussions from it? No. And nothing came about it. No, no trouble at all, nothing, nothing. Robert Bray, the principal at the time, called an assembly. Now, I don't remember the details of the assembly, but I do remember him saying that we could have tipped the van over and it would have been okay because they were trespassing. <laughs> you guys could have did whatever you wanted to to that van because they were trespassing. You would like to think, again, that, that someone entrusted with delivering news uh, is going to do it in an ethical manner, and they were totally unethical on that day. But we weren't interviewed after. Let's tidy it up, put it in a, and put the box on a way back shelf in a storeroom someplace where nobody will ever see it again. But the principal, uh, Mr. Robert Bray, after we re realized what had happened, I don't know whether he spoke to Frank Coletta, I, I have no knowledge of that, but he called whoever was the news director to register a complaint. And to my recollection, the answer was, well, we'll look into it and get back to you. And they never did. We never attempted to say that, you know, Attleboro High School had a bigger problem than other schools. We had no, we had no evidence. We, we just reported that that was happening there. And uh, to be honest, you know, the assignment editor is to, involved with the day-to-day -day news. And uh, so I then put my attention to the other stories. There were, were probably follow-ups, um, and this is just a guess on my part, follow-ups perhaps with the school committee. Maybe they discussed it at meetings. I, I don't know, maybe your research will determine whether uh, meetings were held and policies were changed. Um, uh, 32 years later, I just don't remember that far <laughs> back. How often have you seen that, that, that thing about five people looking up and pointing when there's nothing there and everybody comes over because they wanna, yeah. they wanna see what's going on? Barry Brewer, police captain. I was told by somebody, hey, you gotta watch uh, Channel 10, there's uh, this, and I can remember watching my little black and white TV and seeing the, the van start wobbling uh, side by each. I'm not certain if she ever went to the police later and said, is it true 
that you are aware of this happening. The funny thing is, is, is were any charges brought um, forward, and I would, you know, I really didn't see a crime there uh, because, you know, were the trespassing signs up? No. The kids rocked the car, uh, you know, probably at best disorderly, but rolling back as a child, this is what I'm going to next year. Well, after that, we stopped because then they had all the cops coming in the next day and they had, you know what I mean? Because they caught us now. That's what they were trying to get rid of, the party and in the pit. Everyone thought they had cameras in Capron Park and all this other stuff trying to find out what was going on. And it did slow down, but it didn't stop anything. They didn't give us all the footage either. If you showed me all the footage, that was, they didn't give us all the footage. I think they owe us footage. Meredith and uh, the producers of the newscasts uh, were very careful with how the script was worded in a story like that. I'm not sure they have, I think that's probably all they have. I saw, no, I saw that's... them on the tape or whatever, but hey. These were um, hour long uh, archive tapes. At the end of every newscast, we'd take all the video from the show and transfer it to this. I want to see the footage of the kids pedaling. They got close up footage of kids pedaling in the pit. And this is our permanent archive. I remember watching the video and seeing <laughs> with their eyes blacked out. Unfortunately, the technology at the time did not allow us to put reporters narration onto the videotape, which we have in storage from 1979. So the script isn't there. What we have is uh, the footage that was taken and the interview excerpts. And at the time, the TV station was on the fifth floor of the outlet company in Providence, the outlet department store, and we have moved twice since then to other locations. So a lot of that written record is not available. If that was their actual edited footage that hit the, that hit the TV, would that not be what they kept? Yeah, unless they had a couple tapes and they mix it all live to what you see on it. Mm. Yeah. I wasn't aware of the news ever being wrong and, and you know they're telling us oh they're smoking marijuana and they're there there they are right there. You saw in that video girls lighting up and it would uh, do did, did kids try to sneak a smoke? Absolutely. But watching that, I think she put them up to that also. And why do I say that? I say that because she came into the building without permission, went into the to the girls in the lavatory. With that cameraman, how he, he got by, by us, I don't know, and asked them to light up in the lavatory and took shots of it, which I don't think ever appeared on TV. You know, the smoking marijuana right out in the open, well, now with color and, you know, a better eye, it's, well, it's cigarettes. It wouldn't surprise me if she also hadn't staged the students lighting up that you see in this, in this uh, video. You know, it was very interesting because it was part of Attleboro and Attleboro wasn't in the news. You know, it was an introduction, I guess, uh, to uh, mobile video. That was a startling uh, discovery or a startling revelation in 1979. It might even have been today. 200 drug dealers yeah. in one high school. Uh, it was true. How many years have we waged the war on drugs? And one just has to ask the people around them is, you know, um, are you, have you stopped using illegal drugs? Everybody that I know around here is pretty much still doing the same thing they did back then. I'm 50 years old and I still bang my head to Metallica, you know what I mean? Attleboro will never change on that end. Other 50 year olds, you know, they're all bald and you know, they look, they look down on me because I still kind of have the mullet going on and I listen to a different kind of music. And, and I don't smoke every day, but you know what I mean? I'll take a couple of hits. I don't smoke five joints in a row like I used to, but <laughs> you know what I mean? A couple of hits here and there to get the blood pressure down. As much and as often as possible. Um, I don't know. Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> well, I think the war on drugs, we all know, has been lost. Why have we lost it? Well, there are all sorts of theories. Uh, they abound about why we've lost the, the drug war. The more risk and penalty involved is now there's a, co a higher cost associated with it. But at some point, there is you know a tipping point. You know something, this is worthwhile to me. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make a ton of money and hop out. I think the country uh, probably would make a lot of money off of it. Times change. What is acceptable 20, 30 years ago may not be acceptable 30 years from now. So I think so long as there's you know, a need, it will be filled by somebody. Don't be stupid, you know. 
they should probably regulate everything. If everybody wants to be idiots and, you know, I mean, but back in the 20s and, uh, you know, in the early days, they used to do that. Christ, they used to mail your heroin and hypodermic needles in the mail to you, you know, for pain management. Drugs are a part of society. Whether that was true then, it's true now. Who would have thought, however, that nowadays, at least in the state of Rhode Island, we're in the process, possibly, of setting up medical marijuana dispensaries. A lot of people still, uh, while it's legal, federally, uh, under you know the Drug Enforcement Agency, it's still no longer legal in the United States in any way, shape, or form, medical and or personal consumption. Now, I mean, everybody's just way too uptight, in my opinion. I would say to kids that I was mentoring, you know, if you do something wrong, you've got to pay the price. I'll stand by you, I'll support you while you do it, but you're going to pay the price because that's the way it should be. Okay, you may not be harming others, but what about yourself? Can a kid who's 13 years old and weigh 100 pounds smoke a joint and still be functioning in normal part of society? Absolutely. Should he be smoking it before his English class or before he goes to algebra? Absolutely not. As I look back, I say, you know, it didn't create anger or animosity against people, but it did, in turn, take away your ability to want to achieve. For every instance where I saw kids hooked, the entry level into drug abuse was via marijuana. What got you into that whole, you know, just because everybody was doing it, you freshman, you were already just, you were right into it? Well, actually, we were doing it in seventh grade at Thatcher. And there used to be a place out, like a, they called it the butt path over at Peter Thatcher Middle School. And everybody was like, ooh, don't talk to those kids. And I didn't think I'd ever quit. I said, I'll never quit. And it's been over 20 years, no drinking, no smoking, no nothing. I think there was just one week where we couldn't get any pot that I wasn't stoned. So I was just really a stoner. Oh, I've come to terms with it. Yeah, there's a lot of regrets. I mean, uh... <laughs> made a lot of stupid choices in my life. I mean, me, I watch my kids, I pay attention, I know if something's up, you know what I mean? I close to, I'm on them all the time, you know? I want them to be better, I want them to go to college. Probably still making a lot of dumb mistakes, but I'm doing okay, I'm working, and um, I have a great wife and a good family, you know? No, of course it worked. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a upstanding citizen now. Come to Randy's Cigar Box, Route 1A in South Attleboro. <laughs> Say, Dad, you did it. What about me? No, my, my children don't. I used to say to young people, this is the last time in your life that you're gonna have people of this education level interested in you without the interest of making a buck. Yeah, stay in school, get a good education, and you know, be smart, really, because that's the way to go. After this, our society being capitalistic is, if, you're, if I'm gonna hire you, I'm only gonna hire you because you can make money for me. Use your head and, you know, get a nice secure job and raise a good family the right way. And it's like we grew up a little too fast, wanted to be adults quick. Okay, to sum up the whole group of people, arrested development. You know, we were, we were stymied by the weed, lost in a cloud. Think about what we're trying to do as school people, what all school people are trying to do, and that is to impart values to young people for life. And if somebody had sat us kids down and kind of said, hey, you know what, you guys aren't really doing anything wrong. You're just choosing the wrong time to do it. There's too much hero worship of people who have done things that are illegal, who now are praised and held up as models to our society. I did think that the name Meredith Vieira stuck in my head as the reporter who was on that day, and it turned out that I was correct, and it was Meredith Vieira who was there. She hasn't changed very much. She's still got the reporter's instinct. She's still got uh, the desire to get the whole story out on the air. She still has the same outlook on life. You know, she's a great reporter and a nice person. And then for her to go on to become a big television star, what does that say to people? It says, hey, any way you can get there, that's the way in our society to do it. Oh, she turned out to have quite a career in uh, reporting. What kind of an example is that for the young people? I hope it didn't hurt you when I was dipping the van a little bit. No. <laughs> well, it, uh, it was a good piece. That was probably uh, very appropriate for today that uh, it, it got stretched out a little bit. And it's, it's always nice to see uh, someone who 
got their really career start at Channel 10 in Providence. A lot of fans in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Anybody want a connection to Attleboro? Do you have anything fond memories or anything like to say to all the fans who love you in Attleboro? Oh, that's so sweet. Um, I, I can't think of a particular memory, a memory particular to Attleboro, but it's a, it's certainly a lovely place, and I appreciate the folks who are there that are fans. You know, you, you do the best you can, and you hope that maybe your work resonates with people. But uh, at the end of the day, we're all Rhode Islanders. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, for the move downstairs. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And John, quick, for and everything like you know, try to use your head a little bit and, and, and use your thinker. Don't not use your thinker just because somebody tells you not to. I don't know if that's good. That's great. That's it. That's all we got. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Much. No Thank problem. Thank you very much. Appreciate you sharing. Yeah. Joe. All right, man. Good. 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 No problem. I wish I could pay you. No, no, no. Cool. Yeah, so I'm glad because Savage called me and said, yeah, there's some other people doing it, man. Don't give him the interview. <laughs> and that's why when you called me, I was like, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's Dude, I love to hear you guys crank it up sometimes. Yeah. Play, huh? Thank you. It's a great experience. Okay. All right, well, thank you. You're welcome. All right. I think, I think that's good. All right. Is there anything you want to add? No, you covered it well. Yeah, thank you.